Good morning. That's a nice question. Where's your family? It's good to be part of this big family, but we're praying that one day Green Hills Christian Fellowship will be one big church family composed of many smaller families we call the growth group. That's why, friends, our topic this morning is very important also because if that happens in the future, and we hope the sooner the better, then we better have a unified mind among ourselves. If you were here last week, we talked about having a united stand. That means that you and I, we stand firm, and we stand together, united as a church, as a body of believers. And today, Paul would continue the same trend of thought when he calls you and me, friend, to unity, a unified mind. But before we do that, could you join me in a word of prayer? Our loving Father, we ask you, Lord, to once again, as we open your word, open our hearts and minds to the words of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that as we look at what Paul told the Philippians, we see ourselves there as a church. Thank you, Lord, for the affirmations of Paul to his most beloved church, the Philippians. But thank you also, Lord, that because of his love for this church, because he loved them so much, and because you love this church, you put words into his heart that are written for them and are now written for us. Help us heed these words, Lord, because we know you love Green Hills Christian Fellowship. We know you love every person who's here this morning. None of them are here by accident, Lord, but by your sovereign purpose. Will you, Lord, again lift up Jesus Christ in our midst today? And as he is lifted up in him alone, may you be glorified, Father, because we ask this for the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Throughout church history, if you'll be reading even from the time that Paul was writing the book of Philippians, persecution of the church had started. Soon after this, Paul would be released after he had written Philippians. And then the emperor Nero, we are told by historians, would set Rome on fire and then blame the Christians, resulting in a statewide persecution and hunt of all believers during Emperor Nero's time. And that would include eventually the final imprisonment and finally the beheading of Paul, his martyrdom. That's external persecution, friends. It went on even long after Nero. It has gone on until today in a lot of countries. You know that there are still countries who are close to the gospel for religious reasons or political reasons. And yet notice this throughout the dawn of history. Whether it started at the time of Nero, it continued somewhat under the Dark Ages, they call it. God stepped into history through the Reformation, which blessed a lot of lives at that time and continues to bless us today. You'll notice this. External persecution rarely wiped out any church in any locality because often it would even strengthen the church by purifying it. Making sure that those who stayed in the church were people willing to die for it or be persecuted for it so that the people who stayed there would in fact strengthen the church. But also throughout history, you learn this. When the problem is from within, when there is internal strife that starts and then lingers and then persists, it swept under the rug. Or people say, I'll just be polite, I'll be courteous, we don't have to talk. Or I'll just not look his way. I'll just try to ignore him or her. When such things, friends, persist in any church, big or small, it's just a matter of time. It crumbles from within. And friend, that is what Paul saw on the horizon. Remember, we're talking here about a very ideal church. There are two very good churches in the epistles of Paul. One is Thess the Thessalonian church. The other is the Philippian church. But even if you compare the two, his words of love, concern, and longing would, would make some Bible scholars say, and I tend to agree with them, this was his favorite church, the Philippian church. He saw a problem in the horizon. 
We called it a disease last week that was beginning to show its symptoms and Paul was concerned. It was internal, internal strife. And through the wisdom of God's Spirit, Paul knew, I better say something. He was actually saying to them in a gracious and loving way, your disagreement revealed that there is a spiritual problem in your midst. It's not going to be solved by rules or threats. It's going to be solved when your hearts are right with Christ and with each other. I'd like you to notice the way Paul does this. Those of you in the fields of education would know this. Sometimes the direct approach is good. This is what you're going to do. But look at Paul. He takes a more indirect approach, which is often more effective. First, he tells them, I'd like to motivate you. I'd like you to want unity by making you realize God has done these things for you and me. He continues to do these things today. And I'd like you to realize when you look at what God has been doing and done in your life, you want to desire unity in your midst. After that, He tells them, now this is how it looks like. And he presents it in a positive way so that you and I will want it. We look forward to it. And that's when he'll now say, now this is your role in it. That's how we'll study the passage this morning, friends. In verse 1, we will first see that the motivations for unity are our spiritual realities. The motivations for unity. How do you entreat friends who seem to have started going off in the wrong direction. You appeal to their relationships, and that's what Paul is doing. He'll make here four statements which are the basis of his appeal to them. Uh, In your NIV or even in the original, they all start with the word if. But that is the kind of conditional sentence, friends, which assumes the reality. So, I know it says if there in Philippians chapter 2, but If you would replace the idea of if with the phrase, since you already have, it makes it clear. Paul was saying, I hope you have these things. No, that's not what he was saying. He's saying, since you already have these things, and because of what God has done and keeps doing for us, Paul would say, this unity is not acceptable at the same time. At the same time. True unity is practically realizable. And that's what he's going to tell us, friends. First of all, he'd tell us that Philippians, you know God's encouragement or comfort and salvation in Christ. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and the word encouragement there, friends, is the same word used to describe the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16. It's the idea of somebody who comes beside you to help you in your walk. That's the word that Paul uses here. And he's saying, because you have received such continual encouragement from Christ, counsel, help, assistance, since you got saved, you've been given so much, doesn't that inspire you to give back to Christ, that which is so precious to him? Your unity among yourselves, that's what Paul is doing here. He would say it another way in the second thought. He says to them, if any comfort from his love, which really means since you have received comfort from his love, you have experienced the comfort of Christ's love in suffering and danger, and you've known this. There were times in your life, my life, we were hurting and discouraged. God stepped in. He used other people to lift us up. Or he will use your quiet time. Or uh, you'll hear somebody say a word from the Bible and it lifts you up. And that's what Paul is now referring to. When you're hurting and discouraged, God will comfort you. The Trinity understands suffering. They saw the second person of the Trinity go through that all his life. To be despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And so now Paul is saying, you have been so constantly encouraged by Christ in your walk with him. You've been so constantly comforted during the low points of your life by Jesus Christ. Because of that intimate relationship which he has poured his love and grace into your life, shouldn't you be compelled to give back to Christ what his heart desires? Unity among yourself. That's what Paul is really saying. It's an appeal. But the appeal is based on what God has done for us, friends. And then thirdly, he'll say, 
Since you have fellowship with the Spirit. In other words, you have a common sharing in the Holy Spirit with other believers. And you've been blessed through the ministry of, of the Holy Spirit. So God wants us to know, friends, when you feel alone, God is there for you. Now sometimes, I've been there. Sometimes you say, Lord, I know your Holy Spirit is here, but it would sure help me if there was something that I could hear, touch, feel. That, friends, is where your participation in the Holy Spirit, being in the lives of other believers, comes in. That's what being part of a church family is about. That's why we keep saying, we hope all of you one day will be in a small group. We call it here growth group. Why? Because the bigger a church gets, the more you and I tend to get disconnected. If you're not in one, you're missing quite a lot. So friends, that's part of what Paul is saying. You have a common sharing in the Holy Spirit with other believers. You've been blessed with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially with other believers. And because all of this has happened for you, the Holy Spirit cleanses you of sins on the day of your salvation. He fills you now. He helps you bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Those fruit are seen in your lives as evidence of your salvation. He gives you strength against the evil one. He helps you fulfill the word of God. So that reading, studying the Word of God is not a demoralizing experience because, you know, the Holy Spirit inside you enables you, strengthens you to fulfill the Word of God. Because of all these things that the Holy Spirit has done for you, Philippian believers, will you also consider precious then? What is so precious to the heart of God? Will you not anymore disrupt that which is so precious to the heart of God? The unity of his church family. And friend, that's what Paul is saying here. I hope you realize, friends, first of all, this is coming from the heart of God. Paul is simply the mouthpiece of the Lord. The same time, I hope you're reminded that you can feel the presence of God caring for you often in the smaller family we call the growth groups. That's why this morning we invited somebody whom the Lord comforted in one of those trials that she went through in her life. Because until the Lord took her only son home, her growth group was beside her all the way. The lessons they learned and their presence was a blessing to her life. We'll ask Melva Likayan to come here, friends. Share briefly to you her testimony about point number three here. Let's welcome Melba. Good morning. My name is Melva Elikayan. I am a GCF member and I serve as a member of the Chancel Choir. I always praise the Lord for the joy I had having been a mother to my twin boys, Miki and Mimel. When Miki turned seven in 2002, he was stricken with dengue hemorrhagic fever and went ahead to his maker peacefully. When his twin brother Mimel turned 15 in 2010, he was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a life-threatening condition. I cried out in anguish to the Lord. God reminded me of how Jesus once calmed a storm. Since then, my family called our trial a life storm with Jesus. In February 2011, Mimel was stricken with dengue, the very same kind that Miki had. But Mimel managed to face leukemia and dengue valiantly with the Lord. He told me to smile because Christ was in our vessel. God gave him a miracle healing from dengue. In March 2011, a relapse of leukemia came about. He had to undergo an immediate reintensification phase of treatment. God used kind-hearted people to help us without any condition. Mimel's condition improved, but another relapse happened in September 2011. He was given six months to live. This crushed my heart, but I remembered God's promise that he is with me. 
As a child of God, I could rejoice in the Lord in the midst of suffering. A very significant and sympathetic group of people who are very compassionate with me, Mel, and my family is my growth group, the salty and bright growth group. They are our family here in Manila. I thank God that our church has this growth group because it is a very good venue to nurture our faith in God. I learned many things and grew spiritually in our Bible study and fellowship in the growth group. Before my family encountered the painful trials, our growth group Bible study was about the parting of the Red Sea. Little did I know that I would face the entrapping Red Sea of my life. Praise be to God. He prepared me through our Bible study that God will make a way even if he has to split the sea to do it, so to speak. The studies and trainings that we had in our growth group had helped me a lot in confronting life's tribulation. Likewise, my participation in the chancel choir has helped me a lot in my times of difficulty. These are blessings from being involved in a ministry. Our last five weeks in the hospital was the time when we stepped out of our boat onto the stormy sea. Our group group had surrounded us with their physical presence and constant prayers. During Mimel's last moments, he was very calm, not afraid at all. He said that God is good and has healed him already. Mimel thanked God for his parents and the many people who loved him. The members of my group group had been with Mimel in the hospital up to the very moment the Lord took him home. My group group has been truly my family. We asked for a miracle healing. We did not doubt. We expected for it. We wanted to glorify God in the storm of our life. But God in his own sovereign plan has Ways that are higher than our ways. Mike, my husband, is there, and I did not have to question God. Instead, we submitted to his perfect will. As I see it, Mimil is completely healed and in perfect health right now. He had won the battle. Yes, I am in grief over the absence of my twins, but that grief will be overpowered by the comforting embrace of my loving Father in heaven and the assurance that my twins are in perfect condition with Him. I can truly rejoice in the midst of suffering because of the Lord Jesus who is with me. All praise and glory to Him. Thank you. Praise God. And I hope you will find yourself in a growth group too. Um, you see how they were there for her during the low points of her life? That, friends, is a common sharing in the Holy Spirit. And the lesson, God used those lessons to strengthen her, to prepare for that eventual trial she would go through. I hope, friends, you will see the value. And uh, we do have a third of portion in the bulletin. Now, I've been told this. In the past years, we didn't do a very good job of, of following up those tariff portions. We apologize for that. If you've been victimized by that fault of ours, please forgive us. And then give us another chance. Tear it off, fill it out, and then give it to the ushers or to, to myself. And if you want to be in a growth group, we'll make sure you land in one. So, friends, number four... It says, when God began his good work in your life, you received this tender mercies and compassion, which is what Paul really meant when he said, if any tenderness and compassion. So he's saying, from the day you got saved, that was an act of tenderness and love on the part of God. But it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. God did not stop loving us on the cross of Calvary. That tenderness, that compassion goes on till now. To you and to me, despite our feelings about ourselves, despite how others see us, friends, He just loves us unconditionally because that is the kind of and nature that God has 
uh, for us, friend, the kind of love that he has for you and me, friend. So Paul is saying, because you've received all of these four things, shouldn't you have the same mind among yourself? Shouldn't you be united among yourselves? Which leads us, friends, to the second point. Having shown us through our relationship, through the way that God has treated you and me, friends, why unity really matters and how out of love and gratitude for God, we should make sure we make it happen among ourselves. Now he paints for us a picture of unity. That's the manifestation of unity. It's just one thing here. It's a unified mind. It says in verse 2, make my joy complete by being like-minded. Now, the word being like-minded in the NIV is actually just one word in the original. That word is actually saying just have one mind among yourselves. And we chose, we decided, friends, to make this a category under which the next three uh, things that Paul would mention fall under because the same word, the same idea occurs ten times. The same idea of being like-minded, of course, ten times throughout the whole of Philippians. It shows you. It's a bigger category, and what follows after this, those three things, are really ways that Paul would use to describe what true unity looks like. And if you want to have an idea what the one mind is talking about, is, it's found in verse 5. This is really the kind of mind that Jesus Christ had and extending to verse 11. What was the mind of Christ? Verses 5 to 11 could be summarized this way. He humbled himself. He allowed himself to be humiliated by men. He willingly laid aside the privileges of deity to serve the purposes of God. And then when he had done that, he knew that God would vindicate and exalt him in God's way and time, and that's what happened to Jesus Christ. Friends, it could be the pattern of my life and yours. Can we humble ourselves to serve the purposes of God, trusting that God will vindicate and exalt us? That's the mind of Christ. That's the kind of mind we, have, we should have towards each other. So first of all, Paul would say, being like-minded, true unity, a unified mind means having the same love for each other. There's a quotation I'd like to read for you. He said, Christians are like porcupines. They have many good points, but they are hard to get close to. The main reason is their prickly personalities keep needling each other. End of quote. That's quite true. We are like a fellowship of porcupine. But I hope we stop needling each other friends. Aren't you glad? That when Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples. He didn't say, because you like one another. Uh, you might say, Pastor, I prefer like, because all I need to do is click, on, click it on Facebook. Like. That's not the kind of thing that God wants us to do, friends. You know the problem with like? It's connected with what you get from it. If I say, uh, I like you, Joey. It's because maybe Joey does something for me. He buys me Starbucks every week. You don't have to start doing that. <laughs> um, or so on. Like friends is often selfish. But love, the word that Jesus used when he said, By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you love. The word there is agape. Just a quick review. What is agape love? Agape love is unconditional. It's simply a unilateral decision on the part of the giver to give it. It doesn't depend on the worthiness of the recipient. Even if you don't respond to it, even if you're not worthy of it, the giver of love in agape love simply says, well, I will love you. Whether or not you deserve it, whether or not you respond to it, I just love you. Agape love is also sacrificial. It says, it might cost me something. It often does. To love you, but I will still love you. That's agape love. And friends, that's the kind of love that Jesus was referring to when he said, By this shall all men know, and this is the same love Paul is referring to here. True unity means having the same love for one another. Like doesn't work. Love even that unlovable person in God's time, in God's way. He'll make you perhaps like that person too. 
But you really start with making a decision. I will love you. Even if you don't deserve it. Even if you don't even look at my direction. I will simply decide to love you. Because that's the way that God loves me. The second characteristic of true unity. Because Paul wants to paint a good picture of what it really appears. Is that it means having a united spirit. The word Paul would use here, friends, they say is an invention of Paul in the original. He invented a new term for this. It's literally translated as joint souls. A united spirit is joint souls. Paul said your souls are knit together. You have one affection, one passion to be together among yourselves. And a good picture of this, friend, is like if I have a bag of nails. Now, I wish I did have a bag of nails to show you. But if this bag of nails is in a plastic bag, they are, in a sense, united, right? How are they united? By the presence of the plastic bag. But if I tear the plastic bag open, all the nails fall out. Why? Because they were united by an external force. It's like people who say, you know what? We're united in our church. Why? We're in the same building. You see, that's the same idea. A bag of nails held together by a plastic bag. It's like a group of people say, we're united because we worship in the same building. But what if I take a magnet, and after those bag of nails are scattered on the floor, I sweep the magnet across those nails and hold it up. You see, they're now sticking together. They're now one unit. That, friends, is God's concept of unity. You're not united because you're in the same container called Green Hills Christian Fellowship Building. You're united because there's a force inside your heart that binds you all together. It's the love of God for you and me. And we're exerting that towards each other. God gave us that love from Him. He gives us that love for each other. It's what unites us. That's what Paul is saying here when he says, a united Spirit, and we will never compromise on certain things, by the way. When it comes to doctrine, there are non-negotiables. A quick review again. We will never compromise on the inerrancy of the Word of God. We will never compromise on the deity of Christ, the trinity of God. Salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, therefore by grace alone. Those are non-negotiables. The necessity for a changed life, as proof of salvation. These things have united true believers across the century. But when we're talking about feelings, preferences, sometimes you've got to sacrifice them, friends. You have to, in order that unity might be true in our midst. And that's what Paul is saying here. A united spirit with same love for each other, And finally, he says here that true unity means having a common purpose. Why are we still here? God gave us the great commandment to remind us that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That you love your neighbor as yourself. But aside from the commandment, there's the commission. Make disciples. That's why we're still here after salvation. If we are united in those things, friends, without giving up the non-negotiables in our faith, then that's what Paul means in having a common purpose. Same love, united spirit, common purpose. Paul paints that picture for the Philippians. He paints that picture for you and me. Isn't it wonderful to have a church where you could actually say to anyone you meet after this service, you know what? We love each other. There's no doubt about that. And there's no exception in this church you can say that. to. Isn't it wonderful? If we have one united spirit, we have the same power drawing us to each other, the same power that saved us, the same power is in us, the same love that has been given to us, we now give to others. And then a common purpose, serving together because we believe in the great commandment and the great commission. This is what Paul did. He motivated us by our relationship with God. Now he says, here's the picture. Isn't that what you want? Now he goes to the final 
part of his message, these are the means towards unity. This is where he now becomes very practical. He says, now, now that you know why, now that you know how it looks like, I'd like you to realize there are certain things you have to reject. Number one, reject self-seeking and vain glory. These are hindrances. If they're in your midst, Philippians, if they're in our midst, GCF, they keep us from being united. Selfish ambition is the same word used in Philippians 1.17 to describe those people who were trying to hurt Paul while he was in prison. It refers to people who will do things for their own selfish benefit regardless of how it hurts other people. And that's something you often see outside the church in the corporate world where people will backstab each other, do political moves in order to ascend the corporate ladder. And Paul is saying that shouldn't happen in the church family or in a Christian family. None of those should be there. Selfish ambition where it says, I will do whatever it takes to get my way. It doesn't matter whom I step on. It should not be there. I will do whatever it takes, some will think, so that my agenda is fulfilled. And Paul is saying, reject that. Let's not even talk about the next step until that thing is out. The other thing he's saying is vain conceit. Now, that word really refers to the kind of person who will do everything to look good, to appear good, to sound good. Appearances. It was one of those things that made God reject King Saul, from being his king over Israel. God didn't want a king who wanted to appear good, sound good, look good to lead his people. Because even when he had been warned by, by Samuel after he sacrificed, impatiently waiting for Samuel, his only thought was, could you still go with me, Samuel? In other words, don't let me be embarrassed in front of these people. It's still about himself. It's the same idea here. Paul is saying, if you do things for appearances, don't even think about unity. You've got to give this up. Never mind what people will say. As long as in your heart you do what God wants you to do. There was a rich man who decided to take up fishing. So he went to the best lake available anywhere. Rented the most expensive boat. Bought the most expensive bait and fishing equipment. After several frustrating hours under the sun, he caught nothing. So while he was heading toward the dock, when he had ascended from his expensive rented boat, he saw a boy using a pole and a line and a rusty hook, and he had a bucket full of big fish. So he asked the boy, uh, young man, what is your secret? How did you manage to catch so many? I didn't even catch a single one. Oh, said the boy. I try to keep out of sight so the fish won't see me. Perhaps you show yourself too much. <laughs> Friends, you and I are fishers of men. Sometimes the world does not accept our message because they don't see Christ. They see us. What then should we do, friends? What then should we do? That's part of what verse 3 now says. Humbly regard others more important than yourself. We have an idea of this in a quote attributed to Pastor John Newton. He was the one who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. I quote him. He said, If I ever reach heaven, I expect to find three wonders there. First, to meet some I had not thought to see there. Second, to miss some I had expected to see there. And third, the greatest wonder of all, to find myself there. Now that's humility. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 11, friends. When you want a definition of humility, look no further. I believe in the Bible, it's the clearest, it's the best definition, or picture, or illustration of humility. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. We'll in fact take up 5 to 11 next week. Humility is not a weak man's surrender. It's a strong man's rejection of selfishness and determination to be actively concerned with the needs of others. Humility is not weakness. It takes a strong lady, 
a strong man to humble himself and look after the needs of other people. The point is not what others deserve or what others are. The point that Paul is making here is what you count others to be. The focus is not on worthiness to be treated as more important. The focus is, will you count them and their needs to be more important? Let me make you imagine yourself as an ER doctor. Think of yourself as a doctor in ER. It's 1 p.m. You haven't had lunch. And so you're going out of the ER to grab a quick bite at the canteen and in comes through the emergency room doors, somebody who got stabbed. You look at his face and you recognize him. He's the taxi driver who held you up last week. So, your stomach is rumbling. You're hungry. It's one o'clock, you haven't had lunch. And then you remember this guy. He took your watch, your wallet, your money, your credit card, your ATM, maybe even your shoes. And so you look at him. And then you think for a moment. Now, because you're Christians, think about it this way. You say, if I don't help this guy, one, uh, I have a good reason because I'm hungry. Number two, if I don't help him, he deserves it because he held me up last week in his taxi. Number three, if he dies, that's one less criminal in this world. <laughs> now, of course, you won't think that. You're a gcf -er. Huh? You're better than that. You forget your hunger. And you say, okay, let's gather around this guy and save him. Never mind, you say in your thoughts, my hungry stomach. Never mind the fact that he held me up. Maybe I'll charge him my credit card next week. But anyway, never mind. Because whatever my agenda is, whatever my needs are for this moment in time, I will treat his needs above my own. I will treat his feelings, his interest as more important than my own. Friend, that's the foundation of humbly regarding others as more important than yourself because humility is the direct opposite of entitlement. Entitlement says, you owe me. You people, you must do something for me because you owe me. Humility says, I owe you. Is that biblical? Romans 1.14, Paul said, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Why is that, pastor? Why do I owe other people? Because Christ loved us. Christ forgave us. Christ accepted us when he owed us nothing. He treated us worthy of his love when we did not even deserve his attention. He did not care only for his own interest, but for ours. In Luke 22, 27, Jesus asked his disciples, who's greater, the one who reclines at the table, in other words, the one who's being served, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Disciples, I'm serving you. I'm supposed to be your master and Lord, but I'm serving you. Get the point, my disciples, Jesus meant. Friend, that's where our humility comes from. It's when we are overwhelmed by God's grace. It's when I and you think about the grace of God given to us. And God simply blows us away to the point of saying, God, you've done this for me, all for me. Therefore, the rest of my life is not enough to say thank you. The rest of my life is not enough to say I love you back, Lord, because you taught me how to love. That's what it means, friends, to learn humility from the example of Jesus Christ. That's what communion is about. We do communion so that you and I could be reminded of the expensive grace it took for you and me to be saved. And as we are reminded, it changes us. It makes us grateful again. It makes us loving, hopefully, even more of our Lord and Savior because of what He's done. And when we think of what He's done to us and for us, 
then, my friends, humility becomes part of our life. Our focus is not to be on pursuing humility for itself, but pursuing to be like Jesus Christ. And as we seek Him and become like Him, humility naturally follows. And verse 4 is actually, friends, a continuation of the same thought. That's why sometimes it's lumped together with verse 3. But verse 4 says, Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Focus your attention on the interest of others. What Paul is saying here is virtually equal to 1 Corinthians 10.24. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Paul is not saying, I'd like you to neglect yourself while caring for others. There's no biblical basis for that. He's actually prohibiting, he does not prohibit an interest in one's own health or, or safety. What he's against is selfish preoccupation with ourselves to the point we do not even consider our neighbors and to love them as Christ commanded us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 10-12 is clear about this. He said in that verse that Christians must take care of their own lives as an act of love to the rest of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 10-12 And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you brothers to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. That's evangelism. That's a good testimony. And so that you will not be dependent on anybody. That's building up the body of Christ by not burdening others, instead encouraging them. So Paul is not against taking care of ourselves. What Paul is calling for is a Christian concern that is wide enough to include others. When all of us treat each other this way, this unity simply cannot exist. It stops however it has started, friends. Philippians 2, 1-4, read over and over again with prayerful hearts, could go a long way toward curing the ills that have destroyed many churches here and overseas, if only we take this word seriously and to heart. So let me ask a few questions, friends. Are there fellow believers from whom you have suffered alienation and with whom you have not yet been reconciled? This should be addressed immediately. Whether it is you who have offended your brother, Matthew 5, 23-24, or your brother is the one who has offended you. Then Matthew 18.15 applies. Whether whatever situation you are in, reconciliation is your responsibility. And your brother could be your wife, your husband, your child, or your fellow GCFer. May we realize, friends, reconciliation and Christian unity matter to God. Remember, he reconciled us to himself through the cross. He reconciled Jews and Gentiles by his finished atoning work on the cross. The same conciliatory spirit, friends, is in us today. No broken relationship should be allowed to continue. My prayer is that you'll join me in making this your prayer. Lord, work so deeply in my heart that I am freed from the bondage of self-centeredness and given the disposition not just to look to my own interest, but to the interest of others. There's a TV show. I rarely watch TV, but the few times I do, I chance upon a show called uh, Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Have you watched that? Well, I have, and every time I, I see it, I am inspired by it. There's this TV crew, they'll hire builders, they'll hire the community, they'll make a family go out of town for seven days. Then they tear down the whole house, they demolish it. And then after seven days, this family will come upon a covered house. They don't see what it looks like. And then they take down the cover, and the family is a brand new home. 99% of the time, they are broken to tears. The family out of gratitude and joy. But I'm not looking at the family. 
I'm looking at the community that helped rebuild the house. I'm thinking of Green Hills Christian Fellowship when I look at that. I start praying in my heart. Can you imagine the excitement and joy we would experience if we as a community of believers, if we banded together in the name of God to effect change in, in our home, in our church, in our communities, in our nation, in our world. Can you imagine how that looks like? It would be remarkable, friend, to see what would happen if we were united on the same thing, the same mind, the same purpose, with the same love, the same spirit. Can you imagine what it would look like, friends? We can do that, friends. We can be united for God's agenda and God's purpose. We can. We should. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the love of Paul for his church. He loved them so much, he couldn't bear to see them torn apart by a looming disease on the horizon. And Lord, I know you love this church far more than Paul loved the Philippian church. So I am praying, Lord, for our own church. You continue to help us build on the momentum you've given us, Lord. Let nothing derail us, O God, from moving as one family to becoming more and more united, having the same love for each other, being united in spirit, Lord, Loving each other with the same unconditional love that you've given us. Having one purpose. Reaching those who do not know you. Building up one another so that in our trials and our joys, we share all of this. And we build each other up. Enable us, we pray. Lord, how grateful we are. How joyful we are to realize everything you put in your word. You give us the Holy Spirit to enable us to practice in our lives. Thank you that Bible study and all of this is not demoralizing but inspiring, Lord, because of the presence of your enabling Holy Spirit. Help us do things out of love. Set us free from a legalistic mind, I pray. And I know you will do this because you love this church. You love every person here today. We thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.